Welcome to the Growth Lab Podcast, where we talk about finding new clients, winning more contracts, and growing successful cleaning businesses. I'm your host, Matt Harris, and I run the Growth Lab. We partner with cleaning business owners to launch, accelerate, and scale the growth of their business with tried and tested systems and strategies that generate predictable revenue. If you're turning over at least six figures and you want to grow your cleaning business to seven figures plus, click on the link in the description and schedule a call. Now let's dive in. So in particular on Twitter, right? So at Twitter, there's a lot of people who set up remote cleaning businesses as a, as a side hustle. So, you know, 90% of the remote cleaning businesses, they're going to be domestic cleaning. So they tend to rely on Google lead services and, and ads, either Facebook ads or Google ads to generate leads, which is fine um, because, you know, you get leads through, um, you provide a quote and it's, it's all well and good. It doesn't quite work the same for, for commercial cleaning. Um, so the biggest challenge I think that people had is they didn't really identify a market within the locality that they were operating in. So what what type of commercial cleaning did you want to do? Is it you know cleaning offices? Is it cleaning warehouses? Is it cleaning like the more industrial stuff or uh, logistics or whatever the case may be? Deep kitchen cleaning because they just took the broad brush approach of saying well commercial so we'll clean anything okay so the first step is identify your market and then kind of hone in on on the niche that you want to serve so if you're cleaning offices for example then are you cleaning offices for startups are you cleaning offices for established businesses are you cleaning estate agents offices like what which type of uh, niche did you want to focus on and what type of client do you want to serve so the second step was uh, obviously identifying your niche who the key decision maker is and developing your ideal client profile then the the third step which um, they generally tend to struggle with is because they're relying so much on Google to generate the leads then you're not having a real consistent approach with lead generation so you know building the list and, and focusing on um, outreach on a consistent basis because you can do it ad hoc every now and again but you're not really going to get the results unless you're doing it you know unless you schedule time for it and you're doing it either daily or weekly and um, so those were kind of the th- the three biggest challenges that were faced and then you know everything that stems from that obviously uh, we spoke a little while back about residential and commercial cleaning and the, the fundamentals of the cleaning you know that they aren't very different you're you're going through the same sort of process it's only um the location that changes and is a little bit different um but there are i guess uh a couple of additional steps to take into account with commercial cleaning because generally you'll sign some sort of a contract so then there's the negotiation stage and you know how and the pricing to a certain degree uh, and the the aftercare that comes after that as well because you're tied in for you know one two or three years whereas with residential like you can cancel on i guess a week's notice a month's notice so there is a, a little bit of a difference in that in that respect but i think once you get over those kind of nuances then actually delivering the service your customer service you know keeping in contact with the customers learning from them is pretty much you know it can be applied to both um resi and commercial in in the same way Uh, because then it's you know it's customer service so let's talk a little bit more about prospecting because i I know before we came on we spoke about how in particular with cleaning a a lot of clean businesses sort of rely on referrals and inbound marketing Mm -hmm. and obviously tech is is great for that but like what what's your uh, opinion on prospecting in in general like what what is the what's the approach that you tend to sort of educate your your SME business owners in in terms of what they should do with prospecting so I think in terms of prospecting it's a blend because what you've got to remember is and the one thing I hear from all my clients is well I don't use LinkedIn you might not use LinkedIn Mm. if your customers do and they don't like the telephone or don't yeah. or have, I think they say the average person has about 150 emails in their inbox a day. So yeah. how are you going to stand out if you're number 150 and yeah. then you times that by every day they're getting 150, your email's going to get lost. So it's ultimately having a blend and remembering that you are not your target audience. 
potentially mm. and if you want to to open up the opportunities to lots of different demographics then you need to understand that being on different platforms is going to help you so we use linkedin a lot not only do we post on linkedin but we will do direct messages I'm not a massive fan of in, in mails, if I'm honest, yeah. because most people don't use them very cleverly. So most okay. people want to send me an essay in my email. Yeah. <laughs> and I literally yeah. click on it. I roll my eyes and, and just go, Ugh. and I don't even look at it. I, the first thing I do is scroll to see how long it is. That's not going to work. Sorry, my earphones no. keep falling out. That's all right. So... So, so that's the first thing I will do. So I think people, you need to be really smart with your messaging if you're going to be using LinkedIn, especially in mails. But yeah. I use direct messaging on LinkedIn. So I will identify my target audience. I will connect with them. Don't always send a connection, connection message. Sometimes I will just connect with them. Or I might have liked some posts that I've seen of theirs. Then I okay. will connect with them because they might have already seen my name. Then yeah. once I've connected with them, I don't, within 30 seconds of connecting with them, send them a spammy email, a, sp a spammy direct message that then tells yeah. them all about my services and would they like to have an appointment with me. Because yeah. I wouldn't go to a networking event and go, hi, Matt, I'm Christy from Zest Consultancy. We do this. Would you like to buy my services? <laughs> So if you wouldn't do it when you yeah. were networking, why is it okay? You're literally, I think there was years ago, there was a Barclays advert, and apologies if it's the wrong Barclay, uh, wrong credit card company, but I think it was, where there's an advert where someone goes, meets at the bar, then they're going for dinner, they're talking about marriage, then they have children, then they get divorced, <laughs> yeah. and then the meal ends. That's what people are trying to do yeah. on LinkedIn when they send these spammy sales messages. So it's actually... Some of it can be a longer game. So sure. if I connect with someone and they are my target audience, there's a little bell on the profile on LinkedIn on their on that person's profile. And you can click it and it means that you'll get notified every time they post something. Okay. So then once you once they posted something, you can then comment on it. And you've got to come up with some some decent comments, especially if it's, if it's a little bit out of your sector, you've got to come back with meaning. And then what I might do is send them a message to say, oh, I really loved your post about mm. such and such. What, what's your thought process on that? And I might go a little bit deeper. Or, you know, I might leave it a couple of weeks and then engage with and then engage with them. So I will engage with their post, but then I might send them a message. But I won't do it straight away sure. because I think it looks like it's been automated and I think you have to be careful. However, prospecting is a numbers game. So if actually you're after volume, then maybe that is okay. But for our business, we don't do it that way because that's actually we're not after a numbers game. Sure. The other thing that I would do is send people voice notes on LinkedIn. So you yeah, can do it on your mobile that. phone. I yeah. love it. Uh, but really? you can only do it on your mobile phone. Okay. And it's a really short message that you send. It's I think it's it's either 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Okay. And it's short and sweet. But it stands out in someone's inbox. So yeah, instead yeah. of those in-mails that I go, ugh, when I see them, you'd look at it because you're like, oh, because intrigue gets the better of you because you yeah. can't see what's in it. You've got to listen to it to know what that person's saying. So that works really well. And the other one is doing a video. So I go onto someone's LinkedIn page and I've got okay. a, an app that I use that then I'm in the bottom and I might be on their LinkedIn page or I might be on their website. And I say, oh, I see you do such and such. We work with a number of organizations and we've helped them increase their sales by X amount. Wondered if you'd be interested in finding out how we, you know, how we did that. And it'll be short and sweet. You can do it where you're literally just you on the video as opposed to having anything in the background. And again, it's no more than minute, two minutes. And you send that. And the great thing about that is there are some tools that can track that. So you can see if someone's opened it. Okay. And again, it wow. stands out in the inbox. Looks, up, yeah, it looks a sure. bit different. But lots of people are scared. They're scared of, oh my gosh, what if I look stupid? What if I say the wrong thing? Well, the beauty about recording it is if you, if you stumble your words, you just re-record it again. 
And if and if confidence or worrying about how you look or how you sound, you don't like your voice, you don't like seeing yourself on video, you're going to end up being your own assassin of your business because you're letting that be a barrier to you trying to do something different. And lots of salespeople are adopting these approaches. And if you take and procrastinate and take forever to do it, by the time you do it, everyone will have moved on to something. For sure. So it's sort of being brave. Just seize the saying, moment. Just go for it. Just do it. Yeah. And, and and develop. When I worked in the corporate world, we used to use the reference of about te- people having Teflon shoulders. You kind of do have to have Teflon shoulders. And like nothing sticks. And you, yeah. just, you just have to brush it off. If someone says no... Not today, thank you. It's not about you. It's just they don't need your services right now. And then move on and then and then do the next call. Send the next email. Send the next direct message. But yeah. don't let it stop you in your tracks. You've got a target. Set yourself your target and, and just go for it. Don't put barriers think, in your way. For sure. And even even if it is the no, going back to mindset at the start of this chat, you've already you've already contacted them once. So maybe right now it's not right you use your crm you log you log a follow-up in three or six months time you've got a point of reference then to go back to and say look i got in contact last time i know it wasn't quite the right time like are you open for a chat now is now a better time and if it again if it's a no then you go through the same process again and that's how eventually you you do get the opportunity but also you're gradually building up your your list of your list of contacts right So with the clients that come to you, how often do you have to go through and build a process from scratch versus actually clients who are, you know, 95% there, but just need help to tip you over, to tip them over that extra 5% to really make everything pop? So clients are hiring us to build their outbound process, typically. So... And even in the rare cases that they might have a, an outbound process in place, they end up adapting hours. So like from an outbound perspective, it's typically they're speaking to us because, because they trust in our philosophy and our process. Now, on the second end of that is we do get in talks with clients sometimes with like, hey, what does your, your actual sales process look like? And just... I don't want to say the word coach, mm-hmm. but, uh, but we do give some input on like, Hey, this is, we're in this unique driver's seat where we see companies coast to coast in the U S of what they do well and what they don't do well. Yeah. And so we can say, Hey, you're doing this in your walkthrough. Why are you sending your, your brand new operations person to the walkthrough when they've never made a sale in their life? For instance, like mm. there, there's some things that we can kind of help guide along the way. And our team can also, and, and does, follow up with proposals that have been sent from walkthroughs that we have set that have gone ghost because we always want to get to that yes or or a no but really building a process from scratch people are are adapting our outbound process and then it's just a case by case with what their actual let's call it internal process is once the walkthrough happens okay and have you we're not really building process they're like paying us for the result at the end of the day Sure, but there's a few that don't have anything, and then we'll help them out. But it's even like a super overview of a process is just most people just don't follow anything. You don't have to have <laughs> all these crazy audit. Like I think we get in our, we have to have AI and mm. automations and all these different buckets. If you don't understand it, you got to go learn how logic works in any of this before you even try to build. All they try to do too much, and I'm like, it's as simple as put them in one bucket, second bucket, call them follow up via email, connect with them on LinkedIn. Are you doing mm-hmm. your research? Doing a summary. Are you stopping by for coffee? Like, if this is business Simple development. Things, right? Yeah, Simple exactly. Things. Exactly. I love automation. I love AI. Don't get me wrong. We're going to get more involved in it. Do you really need it right now? No. Yeah, and yeah. then the bigger you get, like the bigger the contract, like an RFP is, they give. They already tell you what to do and what the rules are. So yeah, now yeah, the key yeah. question exactly. is, is you're more betting on the presentation, which is your proposal, and your ability to hit their targets financially and strategically. Yeah. So that's so why I'm like, don't overthink And having it. some sort of relationship as well, that, that kind of helps with the RFP process. Oh, 100%. Because, you know, you, you, to be able to have 
open dialogue, not necessarily to give you guidance, but to at least get a little bit of feedback and understand a lot more as to what what is expected. So even if you lose on this occasion, you know, you take that learning into the next process because you understand if you've identified your ideal client profile, you're targeting similar sorts of clients, you're going to go through a similar sort of RFP process, you'll take the learnings from one, you know, flip it into the other. And, and over time, you know, you build up that knowledge bank that's going to enable you to, to increase your conversion rates and also 100%. build up your contacts. 100%. That, that there is like such an underrated comment that you just said your contacts, man, like it's people hard. only want to build relationships when they're doing the sale, but it's like, mm. Do I see you are involved in the community? Do you know, do we, do we somehow run in all the same circles? Like we always say, like, can I live in, like, can you live inside their brain? Like one of my biggest goals this year now is getting involved with the community. Mm. Cause I've been such a virtual guy that I'm like, <laughs> well, then you'll never see me running your circles unless it's virtual or we all fly somewhere. I'm like, how can I get in your circles? And so the bigger the client, the more relationships matter where you can position yourself as the expert the expert that they know in that specific field and so that this is just i just want to say that because a lot of people all they want to do is work all they want to do is build and it's like one of coach burt michael burt always says you don't need more money you need more people because people have the money the more people you know the more money you make get out there and if it's not a sale today it doesn't mean it's not going to be a sale in two years and so you better build now with an intention of just being the person of interest, like the expert. For sure. This is also why it's so important to build your network outside of just your email. Like this is why I should be connected with you on LinkedIn for when you switch jobs and you become the facility director at a new facility. We actually had that recently just happened with a client sold a facility director. It's a good contract. That facility director two years in moved switch jobs. They obviously have a relationship, hired them for that, that next facility. So off of that one relationship, there's two different contracts and two different buildings, but so many people just try to converse back and forth through email, pick up the phone, call someone, text someone, have them on LinkedIn, and also like genuinely care about what the F they're doing. Like you can't fake like intention and it doesn't mean like you have to be some some like big hearted person and care about everything they're doing but you do have to like you know know a little bit about what's going on in their life or ask questions about them you know when when someone gets a new job on linkedin actually look at the position congratulate them know where that the, they came from etc like i mean it, it's simple people skills which will take you so far in the sales game especially in janitorial I think anywhere, uh, any industry, but like being more intentional, that's like business development. I, I love that word because it's, I mean, it's developing the business, the business includes people. It's, and again, I, I can talk all day about it, but it's, I haven't done a great job. I know how to build. I have a great virtual way of connecting with people and have a good network there. Now I need to, I need to get better on the, on the local level, on the in-person events, on the, the yeah, power too, in those as well, man. <laughs> there's power in those. And yeah, there's for a sure. bunch of old people only on those. And we got to make, go make our statement now, you know, go, yeah. go, go in there. So. Well, look guys, we've been going for nearly an hour. I've got, I've got one more question. I just want to ask before Let's I do it with one quick fire one. So. Ooh. You mentioned often you, or, or on occasion, you help people build the sales process or you give them guidance as to how they can adjust their sales process. But you mentioned sales process. So talk me through, like, what, what, does, what does a, a sort of a robust sales process look like from, from start so to finish? So start to finish. So a robust sales process for, I mean, obviously it's going to vary by customer sure. because everyone will have different sales stages that they want to adopt. But yeah. it's it's the journey you take the customer on throughout those touch points of each time you have a communication with a customer. So, for example, if you reach out to a customer, have you got some follow up information that you would send to them? So. Yeah. What you want to do is, we, I talk refer to it as a sales playbook. So you kind of want to have a journey. So we do this and then we do that 
And then yeah. we take them to this stage. And then once they have expressed an interest, we will then we might send them a quote or the, or when they've expressed an interest, we might meet them face to face. Or if you're someone that doesn't go out face to face, we might meet them online. But you're yeah. probably going to go need to do a, an estimate in terms of the the facility itself to see how long yeah. it's going to take to to clean. So that might be that. So then you might automate some processes that as soon as a meeting is scheduled, a email goes out to them just sort of confirming what's going to happen during that stage. Mm. And and then once you've had that meeting with them, you might have again some templated emails that go out saying, thank you for your time. Your quote will be with you shortly. You know, especially if you have a lot of opportunities like that coming along, you might not be able to get to every single one as quickly as you'd like. So having some some buffers in place to allow the client to stay in touch, but not to be able to turn the quote around instantly. And there are tools out there that can allow you to build quotes and there's tools out there that can allow you to do all this automation that I'm talking about. You can set up workflows in a lot of the CRMs so that when you move someone from one sales stage to another, it will automatically trigger something and you've yeah. already put something in place that will get sent to them that say, we're working on your quote, great to meet you and it will be with you shortly. And then while that's happening, you're then building, building the quote for them. But it, it's having those things in place. So it's having some email templates that are ready to go. It's having some, some, some proof of kind of we say we're good, but don't just believe us. Mm. Here's all this documentation. Here's some testimonials. Here's a case study. Here's a video of one of my clients talking about the experience that they've had. And I might use, you know, in the first email that I send, I'd probably only send one. And then I drip feed maybe one or mm. two throughout the yeah. sales process. And, and I try and mix it up from a testimonial to a case study to maybe a video. And I think you're going to get to know the client better to know which one will, will work better. But I also think it's about matching the client's size. So if you are dealing with a huge multinational organization in London and you're trying to win the local pub, yeah. Don't send them that case study because I think what they're instantly going to think before they even get a quote is you're going to be too expensive for me. <laughs> so if you've got a quote of another pub that you do, then well, not quote, sorry, case study, then send that. You sure. know, so match your clients so they can see examples of work that you've done in their sector, similar size organization. And and having that so having that automation in place where you do those case studies, you have a te template already built to be able to send to the client. You might do a PowerPoint, but quite a lot of people now are doing a, a, a very small PowerPoint where it's just like our services, what you're going to get from us, what to expect, testimonial, yeah. here's the price. And having that all automated so all you're adding in is the is the actual price itself. I think just I'm going to bookmark the automation because that is key to this whole process. But as you mentioned, you don't want to send a case study for a multinational when you're going to the local pub. I think that that comes back to knowing who your client is, having your sector identified and, and really tailoring your messaging towards that and having the right marketing assets for that particular client, right? And that how often have you come across like SMBs that that are that prepared or or do you need to start with them from from ground zero quite a lot have got <laughs> a little bit in place I'm trying okay. to be kind here no they have sure. they have got a, a little bit in place some are, are have got lots in place but maybe not using it in the right order so sometimes okay. just trying to literally throw everything at the customer in the first uh, in the first point and and that's the wrong that's the wrong approach you want to keep that that momentum and that contact going whenever I'm going to a client meeting if if they come to me directly I will have obviously looked them up on LinkedIn and before we even meet I will have sent them a LinkedIn request for example yeah. and then once we've met I'll send a follow-up email and yeah. then and then those oh, those additional steps that will happen to keep that customer engaged and sometimes I might send them a video. So I use different platforms and, and you can send a great video. I could do a video of me talking them through the quote because mm. sometimes you're relying on a third party selling your services to the decision maker. Yeah. So if that's the case, you want to try and get across the points of what you said was important to, to yourselves as a company is X, Y, and Z. So I focused on that. 
and you'll see that we're able to deliver X, Y, and Z. And yeah. here's the testimonials from other customers that are really happy. So maybe if you are a little bit more expensive, but you've gone to that extra effort and they can see that the services that you're offering are actually something you can deliver because you've got video evidence or case study evidence to show that you have happy customers, yeah. then that might help it win it. But I think video can work really well when you're trying to, when we talk about process, when you're trying to sell a, a quote in when yeah. you're not talking to the decision maker, because okay. then you they can forward it to the decision yeah. maker. Here's the quote and attached is the video. And it's, yeah, it's, I'm talking like three to five minutes. Okay. So you're not doing a story. It's not a whole yeah. movie That's premiere. That's what the and all that is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's short and sweet. Yeah. Get across what you are as a business and why they would want to do business with you. And I guess it's a differentiator as well, right? Because how often are, are they going to get a quote with a video overview to consider? And yes, even, yeah. even if you're not successful in the quote, like you're going to stick in their mind, right? So when it comes to renewal Absolutely. or another opportunity comes up, then I'm pretty sure that you're going to stand out and you're going to be top of the list in terms of then getting getting in contact with you. Mm-hmm. So you Makes mentioned... You auto- exactly, exactly. So last year we won the best cleaners in the UK at the Cleaning Industry Awards. So for 2017 to 2019, we were cleaning ovens and carpets but again, we wanted more. So I got a portfolio, cleaned a couple of my friends' houses, my mum's house. I let my take before and after pictures and went into letting agencies. Listen, we, we, we do a lot of deep cleaning. If you're looking for any cleaners, can you give us a shout? And I was showing them pictures. I was yeah. going into building sites, saying that we're experienced builders cleaners. If you're looking yeah. for any cleaners, give us a shout. And slowly we started to get work. So I got my mum involved. She was a cleaner. She trained yeah. us up how to clean. Nice. So, well, doing two end attendances a day, working till eight, nine o'clock at night. Uh, and then I got a big contract. It was a, it's a big, rege- biggest regeneration contract outside of London for cleaning new built houses. Oh, wow. Again, I went through the tender process. I shouldn't say this because we're still doing the contract just now, but yeah. kind of winged it a little bit. And we got that contract to clean 800 yeah. new built houses. So I had to employ another couple wow. of people. And yeah. it went, it kind of built up from there. I just slowly employed people. But where I went wrong was I was trying to do too much. I was trying to do ovens, carpets, gutters, boulders. We were just trying to do everything with free staff. So that's kind of. And 800 houses. But that's over that 10 year project. Okay. It was. So okay. we're still currently doing that just now. But there's 25, 30 staff to help us now. So it's no problem. <laughs> So how how did that opportunity come about then? How where did you hear about that? Did you apply for it online? Like how how did you well, the, the award or the the big contract? The big contract. We'll come back to the award, but the big contract. The, the, the big contract that came about. I just I went into a building site. I went into a building site and asked, "Can I speak to the the QS?" And they, they came out and they gave me an email address and I emailed the QS saying, "We're a cleaning company based in Glasgow. We look to do builders cleans." Can you reach out if any tenders come up? And this tender came up, and part of the project was you need to give back to the community and things like that. So I was, I was dropping off the Easter eggs to the local schools and doing nice. food parcel drops uh, in my, my free time. And I was, I showcased that, and I think they, they liked that, and maybe they liked me as a person. And we got the contract over some really large companies. So all of that stemmed from. You go just... to a building site, just go to a building site, asking for an email address and send an email. So no that AdWords, that. no social media, no, none nothing, of that. No, like literally just... never, never cleaned a building site in my life, but mom, she worked, before she came with me, she worked with another cleaning company. Yeah. So she would tell me that when you do building sites, there's a first clean, second clean and third clean. So on the tender, I'm trying to figure out, right, how much is a first clean, mum? How much is a second clean? <laughs> asking, asking her, so... She helped me with the pricing and things like that. That's good. I remember, so I had, when I had a cleaning biz, I did the same thing. I, I used to, I used to live in St. Albans and literally I would just get in the car and just drive to every site and I'd go and speak with the site manager and ask, you know, have you got cleaners arranged? And to be perfectly honest, I ended up getting, you know, ended up getting quite a bit of work as a result of that. And it was, you know, there was a bit of follow-up email, but it was just having the balls to kind of just show up just go yeah. to site or show up at the uh, the building contractor's office. I did that as well and just said, look, 
can I can I speak with the QS or you know whoever is responsible for for arranging the cleanings? What drove you to to take that approach? I've not got a I've not got an entrepreneurial background. None of, none of my family have businesses, anything like that. So I was just I didn't know what else to do. I didn't realise you could have a marketing campaign or things like that. I just thought I'm going to make a portfolio and just go straight to the the person I want to work for. Within the first year, we were doing work for 10 letting agencies. Doing end it only took one to give us opportunity. And then when we went to the second one, I said, oh, well, we do cleans for that letting agency. And yeah. we started to get more pictures for our, our portfolio. Plus, we were, we were cheap. We were probably undercutting a lot of cleaning companies because we had just started. And we were happy to make like 70 pound each per day. Yeah. At the time, that's what we were happy to do. So it was more than what we were getting in our last jobs. Nah, fair enough. Thanks to you guys for listening to the Growth Lab podcast. You can access the show notes and free resources via the link in the episode description. And if you got some value from this podcast, please pay it forward and share it with others across social media or leave a rating and review on whatever podcast platform you listen to as it would really mean the world to me. Hope you enjoy and subscribe and I'll see you in the next episode.